You're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming on iTunes, Google Podcasts, and at DCAUReview.com. Now, here's today's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 68 of the DCAU Review. I'm your host, Cal, and with me, as he always is, is my good brother, Liam. Liam, we have a jam-packed double feature today, covering a pair of Batman Beyond episodes, continuing through season two. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to jump into both of these today, at least uh, excited to talk about them. I'm not necessarily <laughs> excited because they were all that good, but we'll talk about that as we dive in. Uh, welcome to the DCAU Review. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. It seems like we've uh, we've probably done more double features with uh, Batman Beyond than almost any other show. Um, I, don't, I don't exactly know why that is. I guess it's just sometimes the episodes work better in bunches because... If we tried, I think it would be tough to stretch either of, uh, talking about either of these episodes into like a half hour or, t- or even 20 minutes would be, would probably be, uh, challenging. So let's start with our first episode, Liam. And the first episode that we are covering is the second episode of season two, which is entitled Earth Mover, which is about as interesting as it sounds if, uh, <laughs> if you ask me. But let's jump into the plot uh, for that and I'm sure you have the official synopsis from IMDB pulled up ready to discuss so uh, in your best announcer voice as you always do please give us the synopsis for this week's episode. Right this is the synopsis for Earth Mover which was uh, written by Stan Berkowitz and Alan Burnett directed by Dan Reba and the synopsis reads as such Jackie a friend of Terry is being followed by a monster that seems to be made of soil And her quote-unquote father is not really her father. Gasp. uh, Yeah, you you need like the the soap opera like organ sting right there. The funny thing is, is that that so telegraphed that it's not her father, it's given away within the first three minutes of the episode that it's not really her dad. she, She calls him Bill. All right, um, so that plot synopsis breaks it down. What we have here is, let's jump into plot, because this is a weird episode <laughs> they go sort of paranormal there's the introduction of it starts out this girl feels like talks about how she feels like she's being constantly watched and then suddenly she is being watched by this mysterious dirt creature yeah outside of her door and window and we like we already mentioned and we have the subplot that she's calling the person that we assume is her father by his first name and we get a reveal shortly thereafter when she tells terry that it's not her dad uh, this all builds to what turns out to be, like, Toxic Avenger slash Nuclear Man who is trying to get revenge on his former business partner that is now taking care of his daughter. <laughs> oh, man. There's so much here. Yeah. So but yet we, not. We, <laughs> so, yeah, it's an interesting setup. I think the first act of this, it's very ominous. It's very creepy. Uh, we'll get into that in some of the other categories, but the music and the visuals and everything, I think, are all working pretty well. But once we get to the point where we're actually explaining what it is that is happening, because all we really know at first is that these weird dirt monsters are popping up and they seem to be stalking this girl, uh, and then they attack at this site that's going to be like the future site of uh, of Bill's next business, and uh, these weird canisters of chemicals start bursting up from the ground and uh we find out later that it was some sort of chemical mutagen that he was burying in an old mine shaft because he didn't have the money to uh properly dispose of them government regulations will be a a, a recurring theme across both of these episodes but those darn uh, regulations yes uh for disposing of nuclear waste but uh, apparently this, this weird, whatever this nuclear chemical waste was, uh, could uh, warp human DNA, we find out. And uh, it caused uh, Jackie's father, his re- her real father, Tony, to merge with the Earth itself and apparently gives him the power to just control all gravel, rocks, dirt. It's not really clear exactly why... Like, it'd be one thing if it turned him just into a mud man, which is what I thought it was. Nope. But around the time I realized, he, no, he literally, like, with his mind, because they actually, we find his body later on, he's this decrepit, like, mostly skeleton man who's fused into, like, the rock uh, underneath, uh, underground. But 
he's no it's just all he's just controlling it all his mind he can make the he can make the earth turn into like a sinkhole because he swallows up both batman and uh the, the stepdad bill at one point and he can do all these sort of very i guess it's kind of like he can do whatever the plot needed him to do I was powers say, wise his powers were very inconsistent though as you pointed out there's a scene where the bat sub which is introduced in this episode and i believe you've yeah. never seen again the bat sub is entering a underground tunnel, which is clearly made up of rock and or dirt and or a combination of the two. And instead of just simply closing up the tunnel, the you pointed out that he uses roots or something to try and trap the bat sub, which it quickly foils, and thus allowing Batman to get to the underground layer of where this guy spotty is yeah uh, it was very inconsistent it, there were times where he could control the ground enough to swallow batman up and then in the final battle he decides not to just simply swallow batman up but instead make a giant mud creature that's yes. like five stories tall and even as batman is foiling that he doesn't go back to the strategy of trapping batman in the ground and smashing him it he just continues to fight him hand-to-hand combat very inconsistent, very illogical. Yes. The whole plot is, like you said, it started out with promise being very ominous and mysterious. As it's revealed, it is revealed to be a plot and just makes very little sense and doesn't do very much for me. I did not enjoy this very much at all. Uh, in fact, because it was so inconsistent that... The story doesn't make sense. They don't really tell you how the nuclear waste gives him the power. The very end, he's done all this work to get his daughter down there, to trap her down there, I guess, and li- make him make her live there with him yeah, forever. Yeah, he swallows up her their entire house. But, he- but then at the very end, after Batman tries to escape, it's very obvious that they're not going to be able to escape based on the fact that whatever is happening, the ground is crumbling around them. Yes. He makes it so that the daughter can escape. He allows Batman and the... Yeah, and that's another thing, like, the way the episode ends is Batman's fighting the giant dirt monster, and he throws batterings at these canisters of chemicals, which, as far as we know, have given this man his powers, but when, like, more of the chemical spills on the man's, like, decrepit uh, uh, skeleton body... It hurts him and like causes him to lose control, and it begins this cave-in sequence. Uh, but yeah, we could talk about this all day. But we can, since we got a lot to talk about, we'll uh, just go ahead and give our, our scores here. I went five out of ten for my score. I did one notch lower, four out of ten. It's bad. It's it had promise being at least it was something different. I gave it a four for that because it's different. Yeah. But at the same time, it's just a I don't know. It's a bad clayface ripoff. I don't know. Like the the. It's inconsistent. It doesn't. It's not good. Four out of ten. All right, move on to animation and visuals. Liam, I went back and forth with this. I initially gave it a higher score, but then based on what happens and recognizing there's very little detail that is used in the creatures, and I don't know if that was done so that it wasn't Clayface Beyond or whatever. But yeah. the, the fact that the creatures have very little detail means that they should have spent time making things look fantastic. I was extremely disappointed by the look of the Bat Sub. It looks like the Yellow Submarine from the Beatles <laughs> album or movie. It doesn't, yeah, it's, it just looks like a submarine. The the like trademark of all of Batman's vehicles is that there's something unique enough about it where it stands out and you're like, oh, it's the Batmobile or the Bat Sub or the Bat Boat or the Bat Plane. That's Batman's like he has a fetish with making things look like bats. Right. Like, that's what he does. This submarine, the Bat Sub, and you can say what you want. The futuristic Batmobile doesn't look much like a bat, but at least it has the fins like the Bat. Sure. Mobiles typically do. This looks like... This is just a black and red summary. Right. There's nothing... They they swing a miss on that. They missed a huge opportunity to make something unique, especially because they never use it again in the series, as far as I remember. It's not something that reoccurs. So you're using it one time. Do something unique enough for it to stand out. Bad, bad, bad. Didn't like the rock creatures. Thought it was a very odd choice, and I get that the father didn't have to physically speak because i guess he could mentally project his voice to speak but they only used a still 
standard painted. Yeah, he's like drawn into the background, and it's just kind of like his eyes. His kinda eyes glow. glow, right? And he's a skeleton, and they the fact that they made it the green glow to so similar to the color of blight. You already have that green glow, and I get it. It's nuclear waste. It's green. Got it. Sure, <laughs> that's fine. It has to be green because it's nuclear waste. But it, no, just like it. It was a very odd choice, and then until the he's static, he's a static image all the way up until the very last second where his body is crushed, and then we see his hand, detached hand, like is animated. It's it's weird, weird choices for this. <laughs> I gave it another four out of ten. What about you? Yeah, I went a little higher. I went six out of ten. Um, I, it's I I, I I don't totally disagree with anything you're saying, but. I, I appreciated some of the atmosphere. I thought they did a good job, especially in that in the first uh, you know eight to ten minutes of the episode when when Terry first uh, chases down the the dirt monster before they really know what's going on. I thought that was good. I I liked uh, Terry pulls off his belt buckle and it turns into a buzz saw and he starts slicing up that all the cool. dirt monsters. I we don't see. That. I don't think we see that gadget again ever used mm. either. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, well, well, I guess we'll find out as we, we go through, but. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a cool little bit there, and uh, yeah, that's some of the, the fights with with Terry. I I appreciated that they didn't make it look like Clayface, mm-hmm. um, and that it did look like Clayface is more of a mud man, and he and this guy was a dirt man, so uh, the dirt people moved drier, and like they didn't actually pick up their feet when they walked. So they all just kind of lurch shuffle. through the yeah shuffle through the uh, through the dirt. So I thought that was that was well done, but yeah, it's not. Uh, like I said, it's a really good setup, and if it had, you know, if ev- it, maybe if everything else had stayed stronger, you would have felt more, uh, uh, you would have felt uh, more giving uh, when it came to to our scores for for uh, for visuals as well. But yeah, it's it's just for me, it's 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 good, but it's not it's not anything great, and it definitely could have been better. All right, moving on to our next topic, which will be music, Liam. Uh, the music is eerie at the beginning. I kind of kind of dug it a little bit at the beginning, and there's a part at the end that I liked. What was your overall thoughts of music? Yeah, I liked music uh, quite a bit in this episode. I thought the they had that good uh, ominous feeling throughout most of the episode, and uh, and then the the music from basically that whole and final uh, action bit from when the from when the house is swallowed up through when Terry confronts the the monster and everything. I thought all of the music uh, was really well done. Um, yeah, I, I thought this was, uh, as far as Batman Beyond goes, at least in the last few weeks we've been reviewing, this is, I thought, one of the better uh, musical uh, episodes that we've covered recently. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with you. I, I gave it a 6 out of 10. Um, there were some, some spots I thought that they could have used the Batman Beyond theme. I did, did point out the theme at the very end. It sounded a little bit like the traditional Batman theme, a yeah. little rocked up which is interesting, as the sub escapes the collapsing hole. But, yeah, I, I, I think the music was the strongest point of the, uh, part of this episode, especially when you're looking back. We mentioned it last week's episode, which you can find at dcaureview.com or wherever you stream your podcast. But we talked about it last week, how sometimes the music tends to blend in. This, there were definitely spots where the music stood out. Maybe not a memorable theme that you're going to whistle or hum or r- r- stick uh, and say, oh yeah, I remember this theme, but it punctuated the scene very nicely at the end. It's the best thing I can say about this episode. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, six out of ten was my score for Music You. Yeah, I went seven out of ten. So right in that same ballpark. But yeah, uh, yeah, I thought it was it was strong and it it, it enhanced the episode and, and I think uh, definitely helped you feel the feel the emotions that maybe the story was going for. Uh, maybe even when the visual department was letting you down a little bit. I or think the, the plot m- department. Or the plot department in that case, but I thought the music... Uh, I, yeah, I think the music kind of overperformed on what was a, as we've talked about, kind of lackluster plot and uh, not a super interesting uh, visual episode. Absolutely. All right, let's do our voice actors for this episode. A couple guest stars, maybe one or two people. No, like, huge stars as we've been used to. No iced tea in this episode. No, unfortunately this not. Week. But uh, we do have one or two guest stars for voice actors. Let's talk about our actors this week, Liam. Can you imagine if Ice-T played the Earth Mover? Oh, wow. 10 out of 10. I would have gotten a 10. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> or like a negative 10, maybe. But, um, no, yeah, we have, some, uh, we have some guest stars here. We have uh, Lindsay Sloan as, as Terry's friend Jackie. 
who you would... You're not going to know her by the name, but you would know her if you saw her, I bet. Um, she's been in a lot of sh- a lot of TV shows like The League or Psych. Um, she played Charlie Day's wife in, horrible, in the Horrible Bosses movies, which, preposterously enough, there were two of them. I never saw the second one. Uh, it's not very good. And... <laughs> Yeah, so I thought she does an all right job as Jackie. Her job is just kind of be the the damsel and the confused, you know, innocent teenager who's wrapped up in this uh, intrigue. And I didn't think she was particularly good, but I didn't think she was particularly bad either. It was just kind of yeah. That's fair. Uh, we had Dan Laria as Bill, who is best known for his performance on The Wonder Years. Okay. Um, I didn't think he was good. No, I didn't um, think he was good either. And like the whole plot hinges on him having been, like, a scumbag who got his friend killed, and now he's lived with that guilt for ten years, and he's dealing with, uh, you know, his his past sins are coming back to haunt him, and it's this weird thing where he really, truly does love Jackie, and he's trying to protect her and be a good father, and he didn't mean to kill his friend, but he also covered it up and never told anyone, including his daughter, you know, including Jackie, what happened. You need a really good actor, I think, to go through all those emotions, especially in a cart in a twenty two minute cartoon. Yep. And this guy being just kind of okay was not was not what the doctor ordered here. No, so I, I thought I, he was kinda lame. I agree. Yeah, his the scene where he thinks that his former business partner has shown up and is about to kill them, but it's actually Batman, he kinda does his verbal confession. It's it's not very good. Yeah. And then uh, we have uh, Stephen Collins, who perhaps most famously was the dad on Seventh Heaven, mm-hmm. um, as uh, as also Walter Baines Bernard, correct, as uh, from the Office, and uh, yeah, as as Tony slash the Earth Mover himself, and they put like a big effect on his voice. This is the effect that should have been on the voice <laughs> last week. And the final boss battle, but no, we get it this week in a guy who is completely and totally immobile. It's fine. It gave the character a creepy undertone, I thought. Yeah. But at this point, you could have cast anybody as that guy's voice. Right, Bruce Tim could have done the voice. Right. right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's not necessary, because the, the amount of time that he speaks in the human voice is a f- quick flashback scene. Yeah, yeah, it's real quick, so... Um. Uh, like overall, like I said, I think I don't think anyone is terrible. Although, like like we said, we thought uh, the guy who played Bill was pretty underwhelming. So I gave voice acting five out of ten. It's uh, it's all right. Um, nobody's terrible. There's a funny little exchange between Bruce and Terry that I think uh, Will and Kevin do well, where uh, Bruce is like, "This this was a news story only ten years ago. How do you not remember this?" And then Terry has to remind him that he was seven years old at the time. And Bruce's response is. Oh. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty funny. Not enough Bruce Wayne in this episode. Yeah, neither of the ones we're talking about, really. But, uh, yeah, so overall, like I said, just kind of middle of the road, 5 out of 10 for voice acting for me. Uh, Exact same score for all the reasons (laughs) that we talked about. I think more Bruce or more more emotion from the person who the the plot pretty much hinged on would have been better. Nope, not this episode, though. 5 out of 10. Yeah. All right, brings us to our final scores for this week, Liam. That totals up after I total everything up. Gives us gives me a score, at least for this episode, uh, the first of our two episodes that we're covering this week, a 19 out of 40, which is not great, pushing it towards the <laughs> Golem episode yeah. status. What about you? Yeah, I'm a little bit higher there. I, went, uh, I think my final score is 23 out of 40, so... Definitely not an episode to write home about. I think for our rewatchability, we can get through this pretty quickly. Uh, skip skip it. it. Skip it right through. Skip it. Um, and, yeah, that's that's kind of it. It's, it's not terrible, but you don't need to watch it. Absolutely. And moving on from here to our second episode, we, of course, are talking about ep- Season 2, Episode 3, entitled Joyride. Um, we'll get to Cal's big picture thoughts on the plot in a moment here, but as always, I will start by giving us our IMDb do. synopsis. In your best voice. Of course. And this, of course, is for the episode Joyride, which was written by Stan Berkowitz and directed by Butch Lukic. And that synopsis reads as such. When a prototype military vehicle with a disastrous flaw is abandoned and seized by jokers... Batman and the vehicle's creator must hunt it down before it explodes. Mm, yes. And that's it. 
<laughs> that you, you could pretty much read that. <laughs> we that could is, just give our flat scores now. Yes, uh, that is the episode. Okay, things I liked about this episode: it's different. There's not a lot of it. All happens in in sequential order. There's no days. It's not over a couple of days. It's a, within a couple of minutes. It seems yeah. minutes at a time. There's some cutting back and forth between Terry as he initially is chasing down this vehicle. Yeah, that's fine, and it's a different villain. It's not a supernatural catastrophe-created villain like we had in the prior episode. Yeah. It's not a villain on the scale of Blight or somebody, or Mr. Freeze or Spellbinder that is potentially life that's going to kill Terry on their own. Really, the biggest... The biggest villain in this episode is the nuclear reactor that is the power driving this vehicle. <laughs> and it's a, it's sort of the case of a mad scientist, except not really a mad scientist. Again, she blames government regulations and the lack of budget on being able to create a more public safe... Like, uh, a vehicle warship? That was, uh, yeah, a... a, a, a Public a warship that is safer to the general public if something were to go wrong. Yeah. So we have this ship that these test pilots are trying out, and the has it's made with a nuclear reactor that they don't tell you right away that it's a nuclear reactor, but if you can like you know pass the fifth grade, you probably could figure out that there was something wrong with the reactor that was going to yeah. cause it to explode and kill a whole bunch of people. So this government agent tells the pilots to abandon the ship, which. I don't know much about the government or how it works, but I feel like that they would tell they would be okay with sacrificing two people, two soldiers, yeah. at the expense of killing millions of people. One would hope. If anything, you would think it would be the other way, and she'd be like yelling at them to stay with the ship until they can get there, right. and they and the pilots would be freaking out, and be like, "No, we got to go. This thing's gonna blow or whatever." Right. Yeah. It did. So they abandon this vehicle. It just happens to be where the Jokers are training or initiating a new member did that member even get a name uh, i believe he is lee okay according to the credits okay so he's either co or lee it's not exactly clear to me so he's yeah uh, one of the jokers and they happen to just be able to punch the right buttons in order to get the ignition going and then literally take it for a joyride where they go pick up burgers and then once they realize that they have a massive military vehicle on their hands, decide they're going to take out the other gang, who is the T-Gang, who look a the lot... Mr. Terrific. That's right, I was going to say, they look a lot like Mr. Terrific. They have T's on their faces, and they wear cool leather jackets. Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't know where they... I think there's... Is, they play a, they play a part in other episodes later on, from my recollection. Yeah, they're, yeah they're mentioned here and there as this, like, this warring gang. Um, but this is really the f- first we're hearing of him here, and then, yeah, it's, uh, the, the lead Joker who's flying the ship the whole time, Scab, who's the same Joker that Terry fought in the, uh, in Rebirth, uh, the, like, the first time we meet Terry, which you pointed out to me. Ironically, this gang has, it's a gang, but we only ever are introduced <laughs> to about seven different members of this gang. Yeah. It's the guy that looks like the Joker, the guy with the... the 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 green hair and the the derby and the blue suspenders mm-hmm. the guy with the green jacket uh, the guy with the Harley Harley Quinn hat and the full like buck teeth mm-hmm. and there's the African American the big jacked up like African American guy yep and, with the tiny hat yep and then Bruce Timm's Joker character right. and the girl right with the with the pink dress yeah now once return of the joker comes around we do get a few new ones with like ghoul and right uh whatever the guy the the big fat dude and the pink thing and, and the dds and but that's still a bit away in the series at this point so yeah. these are pretty much the only it's like it's the jokers who are established as like the the biggest gang in gotham but we only ever see seven yeah there's like seven guys anyway um, with that aside, it, it's, it's okay. It's, there are parts of it that are fun. The end battle between, you, you know, you have this looming, is this ship going to explode and destroy Gotham <laughs> thing? And it's, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb, as Adam West would say. Sure. So it's Terry trying to shut down the, shut down the nuclear reactor, but keeps getting interrupted by the Jokers. 
uh, trying because they just they don't care. They just want to drive this cool car that they have because it's so cool and it's right. made it's made them relevant. Uh, I gave it a slightly better than average six out of ten. I don't know if you want to dust off the disagreement. Oh God, for this one. Oh, no. I gave this three out of ten. Woo! I really didn't like this episode. Man. I thought it was really lame. You gave that a lower score than Earth Mover. Yeah, I disliked this one more than I liked uh, than I disliked Earth Mover. Um, I thought this was very lame. I thought it was not an interesting plot. We get a little bit at the end of motivation for Scab, where he's talking about how this is the the first time he's ever felt like somebody, and uh, and he doesn't want to give it up, and that and that's why he won't have, and that's why he won't turn the or won't let Batman turn the machine off. But then it's like, also, Batman fails. He like Scab has him dead to rights, and then the new initiate. Either Ko or Lee, whichever one is him, has to come in and, and knock out Scab so that Batman can turn all the reactors. So Batman is kind of a loser in this episode. The Batmobile gets blown up, his wings get shredded, uh, the the doctor lady who created the ship almost dies, and he just pulls her out of the wreckage and then just leaves her. In his um, defense, he is going up against a military grade weapon, which we can only assume is be like Batman versus a fighter jet. I guess. I mean, yeah, you can still hate the episode. I'm just yeah. saying. And no, that's no, that's that's a fair. That's a fair. Uh, no, stick to your guns. You hate this episode. No, I'm not. I'm not saying I don't hate it. I'm just telling you that's that's a fine counterpoint if if you want to defend this episode. I'm just. It was just lame. I didn't think. I thought Batman looked lame, and I don't like episodes where you have a lame threat, and so to make the threat seem less lame, you have to make Batman more lame. Mm-hmm. And that's what it felt like in this episode. It just feels like Batman is like. Yeah, so for all those reasons, like I said, I don't, I don't like that uh, that they made Batman look kind of lame in order to punch to pump up the threat of the Joker's in this episode. So yeah, that's for all the reasons I've mentioned. That's why I gave it my my very low three out of ten score. Makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, I yeah, my score was six out of ten. I already said that. Yeah. So moving on to the music in this episode. Um, personally, I just didn't notice it at all, um, and I didn't think it was bad, it certainly didn't detract or anything, but I don't really feel like I noticed the music hardly at all in this episode. I don't disagree with you, I don't have a ton, I don't think I made one single note about the music, (laughs) it was background fodder. It was okay for the final scene. I think it built up some of the intensity, but generic Batman Beyond Rock music is kind of what I would classify it as for this episode, which is not, as we mentioned before, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just it blends into the background. Uh, I gave it 5 out of 10 for music. Yeah, same. Uh, certainly nothing bad about it, but nothing uh, nothing particularly good about it either. And boy, this episode could have used some good music. But. Yeah, I, even like a unique Joker's theme or something like that. We don't get, from my recollection, we don't... I mean, there's more episodes with the Joker's in it, but there's nothing in particular that... Yeah. They could have done more. Agreed. Uh, moving right along to visuals and animation. Um, so it's mostly uh, a lot of air chasing in this episode between the Batmobile and the ship, and then the from the Dr. Price's ship that she shows up and she and Terry drive around in for the rest of the episode. So it's a lot of air battles and and stuff like that a lot of dog fighting um what did you think of the visuals in this episode uh i thought there were some elements i think from a design standpoint it's hard the jokers i i don't i don't hate the way that they look i like that each individual joker has a unique enough look i don't necessarily yeah. care for some of the way that they look we talked about there's only like seven that were ever introduced to anyway maybe a couple more later on but i i appreciate the fact that the gang has a uniform look being all clowns because that's what they are they're jokers but they all have their individual looks about them different sizes different shapes different clothing that they're wearing so i appreciate that i appreciate that the they have a different style there i would say that one of the cool visuals was when they were going through the drive through and they used the the missiles to knock over the giant cow statue at the <laughs> 
at the fast food joint. I thought that was that was a, a neat like okay, this is goof this is a goofy episode. We're gonna get real goofy here <laughs> and destroy this giant cow statue that's outside of this. And by giant I mean it was as big as the building. So yes. the fact that the company th- thought it was worth enough to invest <laughs> In Gotham City, in a giant statue that was as big as the building itself, is just tremendous. Incredible. I, I would like, I would love an entire episode just like talking about the marketing team from that. <laughs> what are the beefy, big beefies is what I think. Uh, yeah, big beefy burger. Big beefy burger. Yeah, I, I think that I would like it, maybe just an entire series around the, the like the marketing team behind the big beefy burger. Big beefy burger. We could get like they have they have rivals that are like the soda cola guys. Yep, absolutely. Um, now we're talking. Yeah, now we're now we're thinking outside the box. The uh, marketing teams <laughs> the mar- of the DCAU. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, outside of that, like you said, it is a lot of air battles and fights and Batman chasing and them chasing Batman. I thought the pilots had a cool look to the, the initial pilots that are abandoned ship and caused the entire problem to begin with because they were going too fast or whatever it was that caused this nuclear reactor to start to breach. Um, I, you know, because there isn't a whole, whole lot, uh, I couldn't give it a a great score, but it's it's fine. I gave it six out of ten. What about you? Yeah, I went five out of ten. Um, it's fine. Like uh, some of the weapons on, on the ship, I think are cool. There's like they, the first thing they do is shoot like a giant ball of fire out of it, which I thought was really cool. And the laser cannons and the missiles and everything, I think they do a good job. The inside of the of the the military vehicle looks really cool. The constant like glowing uh, reactor in the background uh, is is well done, but yeah, nothing nothing great to write home about. But uh, yeah, I think it's solid and uh, one of the better parts of the episode. Um, and moving on to our final category here, Cal, we have of course uh, voice actors. Um, the main one this week, of course, is uh, we have uh, one Wendy Malick as Doctor Price, who people would probably know from. Uh, the, the, I think, a little bit underrated television series, Just Shoot Me. The David Spade vehicle? Yes. Yeah, which... there's there's some good stuff. That's one of those shows that's in weird sort of syndication where they're like, it's on weird network sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah. You'll come on at like 2 a.m. on a local station or something. Uh... Yeah. I don't even know if it's if it even, like, if it's one of those shows now that's completely out of syndication, it'll be on like Nick at Night at like yeah. 3 a.m. or something like that because yeah. it's from that 90s era. It'll be it... like on like Comet or one of those app channels that you can download that just has a bunch of shows for free with ads yep. in them. Yeah. Like, you can probably watch the whole first season of Just Shoot Me for free with ads on, on all those different uh, little streaming apps that exist now. This week's episode of the DCAU Review brought to you by Just Shoot Me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, she was she was on that, she's one of the main uh, actors on that show. She, for, for my money, her, her best role is as uh, BoJack Horseman's mom on maybe my f- favorite television show at the moment, BoJack Horseman. Another animated show. Yes, but uh, I think she does an all right job here. She has such a distinct voice yep. that I almost think it's a little bit distracting when she's in things. That's fair. But uh, I think she does an all right job. And- she's a stern... She's called to play the stern CIA, FBI, government agent or whatever yeah. in this episode, and who doesn't can't tell Batman anything because it's all classified and is going to take care of it by herself, but initially, and then eventually relents to involve Batman and ultimately sacrifices herself and so that Bat and gives up Batman so that Batman could go on and yeah, it's she's fine. Uh, yeah, and then really the only other voices of note are we have Mark Warden playing Scab. He has a very unique kind of rasp to his voice. Yeah. Um, and I kind of like his delivery of all of his lines, and he it seems like the Joker, maybe besides uh, J-Man, the leader, played by Bruce Timm, that has the most personality in his voice. Yeah, I feel like he might, I don't know, I don't know what his credits include, but I, I can't imagine it's very much. It's a lot of, like, video game and, uh, you know, He's minor, mi- yeah, minor voice acting roles, but... Yeah, so he, he he has enough emotion in being able to... It's not a... He wasn't an actor that was cast as a voice actor. He's a voice actor, so he, he knows how to perform enough to get some... some and he plays a tough guy that... Yeah, he, he just cast as tough guy Joker. Like, yeah, that's... Yeah. 
yeah, I think he's all right. And then, as as mentioned, we just got to mention him because it's it's his show. Yeah. Uh, BT Bruce Tim as uh, as joke the Joker's leader. My pretty minor role here, but uh, always got to mention Handful him when he's lines, in there. Exactly. And, uh, always always a great a great deal of fun. Um, and then yeah, Kevin Conroy has one line in this whole episode, um, and uh, Will Ferrell always feels like an injustice. Yes, of course. And then uh, yeah, Will Ferrell. Uh, Actually, that's not true. Kevin Conroy does play the other pilot oh, that's in true. the opening scene. That's he's right. cast, but he's not. Bruce Wayne a has throwback. one single line. Yeah, he plays the other pilot. As apparently, whenever there's pilots, they're just like, <laughs> "Kevin, get in here. We need you to do a pilot." As he did the. Of course, we're talking about the original pilot's voice, the first voice that you hear during the Batman the Animated Series, Correct. the last voice that you hear at the end of Epilogue. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, but other than that, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Wilfred Ell does an all right job. The most he has to talk is with uh, Wendy Malick's character, Dr. Price. He mm-hmm. just, there's some back and forth with them, and he's arguing with her, and she's, you know, she calls the Joker mad men, and he tells them, no, they're just, you know, they're just teenagers, they're just kids who are looking for a, f- a few joys, and so it's sort of them being this, like, uh, reluctant buddy cops uh, uh, dynamic. So yeah, there's there's a little bit of back and forth then, but there's really yeah, there's not much Will Friedle or and there's almost literally no Kevin Conroy, so kind of a weird episode from a voice acting standpoint. Yeah, we don't even see Batman show up until like six or seven minutes into the yeah. episode. It's yeah, very weird in that sense. Um, I gave voice acting a six out of ten, slightly better than average. What about you? Yeah, I. Uh... I also gave voice acting a, a 6 out of 10. Um, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no one... I don't think one performance stood out as good or bad. Yeah. Wendy Malick is fine, as we mentioned, and certainly Mark Warden, who does the heavy lifting for this episode as Scab, is fine. Yeah. But n- nothing detrimental or super fantastic. Agreed. And so that'll bring us to our final scores for our second episode here, Cal... Uh, all tallied up, I have a pretty darn low 19 out of 40. Well, ironically, we have exact reverse scores of our last episode. <laughs> uh, again, as we say every week, we don't discuss our scores before we score these episodes. We promise you, we're not working yet. We're not, yeah, it's a crossover. <laughs> um, yeah, my score was therefore a 23 out of 40. So... I guess that brings us to rewatchability. We didn't discuss that for... Or actually, we did. We said skip it. Uh, for this episode, I think you're fine to skip this episode as well. Yeah. it's uh, We haven't exactly gotten off to a, a hot start with these first couple episodes of uh, Season 2 here. It's funny because I, I feel like the initial Batman Beyond episodes, we scored a lot of them pretty high. There were a yeah. couple of stinkers in there that we didn't care for, uh, but most of them were, were just average or above average and then we had a couple of standouts with yeah. shriek and i think spellbinder scored fairly high yeah melt, meltdown the Mystery meltdown, episode. meltdown was the pilot was, the pilot was, was, was pretty high but it, it's been trending downward here for yeah. a little bit curare was close to close to 30 so a, a pretty good episode but since then we've been in the mid to lower 20s or below for the last yeah. couple of weeks so it's interesting to see see we'll see if they pick up as we go further into season two here yeah and we'll have one more week of batman beyond actually two because actually i guess as as promised on last week's show i'm going to announce now what we'll be doing for next month the month of september uh so the first week of september is our 70, 70th episode which, is which nuts. it's really crazy to think about we've been doing the show for uh just under two years at this point, and uh, you started out as just a, a conversation we had <laughs> about you know what we thought of some listicles about the best Batman episodes, and here we are, seventy episodes later. But to celebrate our seventieth episode, we're going to be reviewing a movie, a DCAU movie specifically, Batman Beyond: Return of the Joker. Uh, very excited to crack into this. There are people who claim this is the best Batman movie ever made. Which is funny because it, initially I don't think it was received as well as they had hoped to, at least as far right. as sales were concerned. Correct. But now, nowadays, if you talk about the the top top tier, especially of animated Batman movies, the, the Return of the Joker stands out as pretty Agreed. darn good. And it's it's dark. There's a lot of stuff that lays 
the groundwork for future and past stuff as far as the DCAU is concerned. Yeah. A lot of stuff that is covered in the, in that movie, Liam. It's a pivotal, it's another one of those tentpole movies in the DCAU or tentpole moments that we talk about that kind of has a ripple effect throughout the universe. Yeah, definitely. So very excited for that for the first week of September. And then, as we usually do, we pick a show to watch for the rest of that month. So for the rest of September... For the first time, in fact, we will be breaking into the world of Static Shock. Ooh. We're going to be leading off with the, with the pilot of that episode in the second week of September, and we'll be watching a couple episodes, uh, a couple other episodes throughout the rest of the month of September. So, yes, yeah, so uh, September, the first week of September, you'll hear our review of Return of the Joker, and then we'll, uh, we'll be tackling Static for the rest of the month. I'm excited to break into that. Uh, that's... Uh, I, I really enjoyed watching that show as it aired on Kids WB when I was growing up, but I have not gone back and watched a ton of it in more recent times. And part of that was because it wasn't really released on DVD until just a couple of years ago. And and uh, obviously with the advent of the, the DC Universe streaming service, uh, it's it's a little more accessible now. But Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I'm excited to break into both Return of the Joker and Static next month. But for this month, we still have one more episode, which we'll cover next week. One more regular episode of Batman Beyond. Excited to break into that one. And that'll wrap us up for today. Make sure to tweet me at DCAU Review with your thoughts on these two episodes. If you think we're totally out to lunch, you love these episodes, let us know. If you also hated them, you can commiserate with us that way. <laughs> any other thoughts, uh, fan art, any, any anything you want to talk to us about when it comes to the DCAU or just DC Comics in general... You can uh, follow us at DCAU Review on Twitter. Uh, head to our website, DCAUReview.com, where you can find our archives, every single episode we've ever done. If you want it broken down by category, if you want to just hear our Batman Beyond episodes, you can go through it by that category. Here are Justice League, Batman, all of those shows, all broken down by category. You can listen to episodes by villain if you like. So uh, Cal does a great job with our website. And uh, if you would, please subscribe to us on whatever uh, podcast app you choose to use. And uh, if you can, leave us a review and give us five stars, because that helps us out a lot. Absolutely. And if we're not on your favorite podcast app, tweet at, tweet at us, and we will get do our best to get on that app. We'd love to. Definitely. If, if you want us integrated and make it easier to listen to us and not to go out of your way, then uh, let us know, and we will do our best to get our podcast on that app as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that'll wrap us up for this week. Until next week, I'm Liam. And I am Cal. And we'll see you soon with another episode of the DCAU Review. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.